Thank you, everybody, uh, and welcome uh, to the Asthma Quality Improvement Program, uh, Wave 1. We are on the fourth action period call uh, of this wave. We are very thankful for all of you for uh, continuing with us uh, in this uh, exciting adventure of asthma quality improvement. Um, and we have a full agenda today. We also want to thank our program partner, uh, the ODH Bureau of Child and Family Health and the Asthma Program. Uh, disclaimer. Uh, the views and opinions expressed in these presentations are those of the authors and do not uh, necessarily represent the policy position of ODH. So our agenda today, welcome all of you. Uh, we will hear um, from Zainab on our aggregate data review. And then our uh, asthma medical director team will share asthma cases uh, broken down by age. And then we have incorporated um, Q&A into those different asthma cases, uh, some of which we have talked about on practice coaching calls. Some of the questions came from uh, emails uh, submitted by you and discussions we've had. So thank you for those. Uh, and if you have a question around um, asthma and, and clinical things that you would like to ask the team, uh, please do so today. You have their ear. And this was also in the chat, um, but if you could please share your name and practice. And what things are you seeing around uh, flu vaccine hesitancy? And how are you addressing those things? Zainab, I have your slides. Thank you. Uh, you can go ahead to the first slide, please. Um, so I've already spoken with uh, most of you and I've shown you guys your individual data. Um, this is just an aggregate level data. So this is everybody's data combined. Um, so I wanted to thank everybody that's already submitted baseline and everyone that's been on top of submitting um, their QI or monthly data. Um, so our first metric that we're collecting data for is optimal asthma care, which is a combination of a few, but um, it should always have, the, the patients should always have an asthma action plan, um, but it could be an asthma action plan and two other things like um, assessing for asthma triggers or um, assessing their um, severity, the severity of their symptoms as um so any uh, combination of those two along with an asthma action plan. So um, there was a significant increase from baseline to the first month of QI, which was December. And we're still seeing an improvement in January. We're hoping to, you know, see that line creep up. Um, we're hoping for an upward trend, which we have right now. Um, but the the more, the closer we get to 100, the, the, better, uh, the better the results. Next slide, please. Um, and then here, asthma symptom control, uh, the majority of the practices that are participating in, in the project already had some sort of um, assessment for asthma severe or asthma symptoms among their patients. Um, and we did see a little bit of a dip the first month of QI, um, but we did see that come back up in January, um, which is great. Uh, and we hope to see again that number increase. Um, that dip usually happens in some in some projects, so I'm not so too worried. Um, it might have been some uh, misunderstanding or some um, something that wasn't clear in terms of how we collect data on the data collection tool. Next slide, please. And then asthma symptom control for diverse patients. It's the same um, as the previous slide, but we're just looking at diverse patients here. So patients with um, Medicaid or patients with skin of color. Next slide, please. Um, asthma symptom severity. Um, we we saw a little bit of uh, a stability between December and January, but we did see an increase from baseline. Again, we're hoping to uh, increase this number closer to 90 and 100%, but overall, everyone is doing great work. Next slide, please. Uh, and then an asthma action plan. So um, if they have an asthma action plan already in place, whether uh, that was edited or reviewed, or if they didn't have one in place that was uh, new um, that you guys um, had with them, that would also, you know, qualify here. Um, next slide, please. Um, asthma triggers and environmental factors. Again, we saw a significant increase from baseline to December. Um, and we're also seeing um, a minor increase in January. Again, we, uh, we're we hoping to increase that closer to 100. Next slide, please. Um, Self-management materials. Again, we understand that um, a, a, lot of play, a lot of practices received our, um, our handouts pretty late. So the month of December is pretty understandable in terms of not everybody um, handing out those uh, self-management materials to their patients, but 
Um, we're hope we hope that everybody has at least some of those now. Um, and you know, just handing those out to your patients just so that they can manage their asthma um, diagnosis a little bit better and try and improve their quality of life. Next slide, please. Uh, patients with persistent asthma on controller medications. Again, everyone was doing pretty great in baseline, and we're still seeing a consistent um, 90% even, even in QI. So that's great. Um, flu vaccine, again, this is um, for the patients that are current on their flu vaccine. Um, we did see a little bit of a dip, uh, but again, here we understand that um, some, pa you know, some patients and some families have some some hesitancy around vaccines. So that's something that we're keeping in mind. Um, but we're still hoping to get that number to increase if possible. Next slide, please. Emergency department or urgent care visits. Um, we're hoping to see these numbers decrease. So this is a great trend that's going downwards. We're hoping to get that number closer to zero. Um, baseline was. Uh, higher than what we're seeing in December and January. So that's great. Next slide, please. Hospitalizations, again, that was pretty low to begin with, but we're trying to uh, bring it down to zero. So again, this downward trend is what we're looking for here as well. Um, so great work there as well. Um, and finally, referrals, we're trying to increase provider confidence um, around treating patients with asthma um, and helping them. So. Um, you guys are doing pretty great there as well. Um, if there's any questions, please, you know, you can place them in the chat or you can send an email to broker or even ask them now. Thanks, Zainab. Mm -hmm. Any questions around the uh, aggregate data? Uh, as Zainab said, some of you have seen your individual data and um, that will be uh, sent out to you um, next week. Uh, but any any questions for Zainab right now? Um, yes, because uh, you will, um, does the asthma, asthma action plan account as self-management materials? Yes, it does. Uh, depending on the version you use, you may have uh, an additional uh, resource on the back of it, or it may go hand in hand with um, an additional resource, but you are um, giving um, education uh, and self-management tips uh, to the patient and families while you are going over the asthma action plan. So I believe that do uh, that does count. Any additional questions around uh, data or for Zainab? Okay, hearing none, Zainab, thank you so much for your time and we will move forward. Thank you. Our first case up uh, is uh, the look at a preschool patient with Dr. Hardy. And Dr. Hardy, I have your slides. If you can go ahead and advance. So um, one more, please. So just going to start off with a kind of a brief overview of uh, um, the things that we've talked about, which looks like this. everybody here is doing a fantastic job in terms of thinking about persistent asthma and triggers. Um, please go ahead and advance for me, Brooke. So the two main control, the two main options or the two main goals of treating asthma are symptom control. Um, and that means reducing the symptom burden to the patient. And then risk reduction. And risk reduction includes preventing exacerbations, preventing any airway damage or loss of lung function over the long term. And also, probably just as important, we want to reduce or eliminate medication side effects. So, you know, I always tell families the goal is not too much, not too little, sort of like a Goldilocks kind of approach to asthma therapy. You go ahead, Vance. Um, so the two big things to think about when you're seeing these patients are um, classifying the asthma control and severity, and then identifying risk factors. Okay. And so uh, we classify the asthma control and severity by rating symptom control. And this was one of the questions that came up. Um, you know, one of the ways I like this, this is the Gina way of assessing uh, symptom control 
Um, you know, there's the ACT that uh, is one of the big things that we use at Cincinnati Children's, which is uh, uh, you get a point score from zero to 27. I like the GINA just because it's relatively simple. You ask, as you can see, four questions. It's yes or no, and you're well-controlled, partially controlled, or uncontrolled. Um, this probably works a little bit better for older kids than youngers, younger children. But the only the point is, it's just important to rate the symptom control. And again, the data shows that everybody's doing this really well. Okay. So in terms of risk factors, uh, things to think about medication-wise, if you're using your BRCA dilators frequently, obviously compliance and adherence is always a risk factor. Comorbidities such as rhinosinusitis, anxiety, depression, obesity. Exposures, smoking, vaping, allergen exposures, uh, vaccination status. Lung function. So a low MV1 or high bronchodilate response is definitely a risk factor. And elevated type 2 cell inflammatory markers. There would be such as Helveda, IgE, or high eosinophils. And then probably, you know, one of the best predictors for future uh, performance is past performance. So if they have a lot of past severe asthma exacerbations, you can certainly consider that as a high risk factor. So again, this is a review. These are slides that I showed months ago, but I think all learning is repetition. So it never hurts to kind of go over that again. So with that in mind, we'll move on now with our, our preschool wheezers. So we have an 18 month old with recurrent wheeze. So full term, you know, no risk, no, nothing unusual with his birth was not premature, but got RSV bronchiolitis and was admitted to the hospital when he was four months old. Okay. Since the fall, he's having these cycling episodes of cough, occasional wheeze, but in between, he's well. So he's prescribed some albuterol over a year ago, which the parent, the mom, reports sometimes improved symptoms, but sometimes it doesn't seem to do anything. Has been in the urgent care twice and got treated with, with prednisone, and he got better. Um, after he started the prednisone, although I'm not entirely sure the steroids helped him or not. Also started full-time daycare back in the summer. Dad had asthma when he was younger, but he outgrew it. And finally, parents smoke, but they only do it when they're outside. Okay, so how would you classify this patient's, we call it reactive airways disease? Would you call it as persistent or would you call it as intermittent and remember if you are going to call it persistent mm -hmm. usually we describe it as sort of mild or moderate or severe not sure that's again terribly important but the point is getting in the habit of sort of thinking is it intermittent or is it persistent and there's no right or wrong answer here by the way at least not for this at this part of the scenario and then next please and then how would you treat him? And also, uh, one more, please. Uh, okay, uh, give, sorry, um, Brooke, if you go back one, what would be you know the risk factors here? So the two things that we think about are the classifying the control as well as thinking about the risk factors because these are things that are gonna go into your decision-making when you think about treatment. So risk factors for this patient would be um, first of all, RSV bronchiolitis, as we all know, having bronchiolitis, even in a, even without any family history of asthma, is going to make you much more likely to have reactive airways disease, at least for several years thereafter. There is a family history here of at least asthma, preschool asthma, possibly in the father. There's exposure to secondary smoke, so he's probably exposed to smoke uh, prenatally, and he's in daycare. So quite a few risk factors here. Okay, let's go ahead and advance. So you're thinking about treatment, going back to, again, this is a little bit of a review, but the NIH guidelines, we have the six different steps here. If you wanna call this intermittent, and I think it's not unreasonable to call this intermittent because the patient's so well in between, you could also make an argument for it being persistent. But for, at this part in this case, let's call that patient as intermittent. And so you would start him on uh, as needed bronchodilators. Now, the other thing you can start doing, as you say here, is at the start of the early infection, you could also start an, a, a short course of inhaled corticosteroids. So next slide. 
So back to our case, you decide to go, we'll call this sort of the dynamic dosing protocol so that when he's in between and doing well, no medications, but at the first sign of a cold, you prescribe, have them take fluticasone. Of course, as we all know, it can't call flovin anymore. Fluticasone generic, 44, two puffs, twice a day, to be used only after you start albuterol at the start of a cough, URI, wheezing episode. So step one. Okay. On follow-up, he is still wheezing with colds. Okay. So now what? So go ahead and advance, Burke. And then now, going back to this, I think it's reasonable to say that we, step one's probably not working. So you're going to move on to step two, which is the daily low-dose inhaled corticosteroids. And one thing to think of, if you follow these NIH guidelines, they, they're really only, uh, this only a, uh, is applicable for zero to four. If you go to, as you can see, if you see step three, step four, to step five, it's really only for children four years and older. And I think that's probably because just these medications haven't been uh, as approved or FDA approved for the younger children. Okay. So advanced. So you, um, the things that we think about when, at least at Cincinnati, when we're, when we're thinking about when to start daily inhaled steroids for these preschool children, knowing that they don't always, they're not always terribly effective, is that we're more likely to begin a daily inhaled steroid if they have clearly allergen positive. So if, in other words, if they have food allergy or if they've had uh, skin testing or any kind of allergy testing and they have at least two or more things that they're allergic to, we're probably going to go ahead and start them on an inhaled steroid. If they have persistent uh, symptoms, or if they have severe wheezing, and severe wheezing could be certainly if you get in, if you get admitted to the hospital, or if you're in the emergency room and you need three back to back to back, or your frequent inhaled steroid or frequent use of oral steroids. So you know you could have argued at the beginning of this that this patient was persistent. You could have argued uh, at the beginning of the case that you put just put them on a daily inhaled steroid. Okay. Dr. Hardy, can we pause for a question in the middle? Sure. For short course ICS, normal dose or high dose? I think that, you know, what, what I'm not sure what high dose is, um, but what we typically do is one per kilo once a day for five days. Sometimes we'll see for kids that are hospitalized, we'll see that um, ramped up to maybe one per kilo. Up, I've seen it up to uh, three to four times a day. My understanding of the, the pharmacology of steroids is that you max out pretty soon into uh, the dose in terms of the effect. So I, I'm not um, sure if there's a huge advantage to going above one per kilo. Oh, I think but, uh, they were talking about um, inhaled corticosteroids. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I was talking yeah. about it. Oh, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> so the question is on the for the inhaled steroid dose. So again, you would... Uh, uh, what we do for the dynamic dosing is probably what we would call low to medium dose, usually about the same for all kids, is fluticasone 44, two puffs twice a day, or two puffs every time they use the albuterol. So that could be high dose if a child is getting that more several times a day. Um, but that's usually the dynamic dosing is is going to be the low dose, and, and or the dynamic dosing is going to be as needed. Whereas if you put them on a persistent dose, it's going to be 44 two puffs twice a day. So at our institution, we've been teaching our providers to do uh, budesonide or fluticasone. We do fluticasone 110 two puffs BID, so really high dose for those seven to 10 days. So there might be some variability about what institutions are doing for this, but um, that's what we have been rolling out here. But again, I know it is a very high dose. Um, and I think we're doing budesonide. Is it one, um, Angela? One um, big BID. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, generally, we've been doing the higher dose because we're doing it in such a short burst for that short period of time. Granted, though, if they're using this pretty frequently, you don't want to do that continually and that they should be more of a, a low dose. So it's it's always, at least from our our when we use it, it's it's very much like they have to let us know if they're using it too often, because if it is too often, then it is, of course, too much inhaled steroid for such a small child. 
Okay. Thank you. So we've got the asthma action plan now stepped up to fluticasone 44, two puffs daily, two puffs twice daily. And one month later, the patient submitted to the hospital for one day with wheezing. He's got a art respiratory PCR panel with rhinovirus and metanumavirus. So they see you as follow-up, and now what? You know, so you've you've tried the dynamic dosing protocol, you've got them on daily inhaled steroids, and they still are coming into the hospital. Probably not an uncommon scenario for many of you, certainly not from what we see in our clinic. Okay. So the first thing is we always want to, at least as a pulmonologist, always want to make sure we're not missing an, missing an alternative cause of wheezing. And that's always my biggest, one of my biggest fears for these type of kids is that I've missed something. You know, you know the old adage, not all that wheezes is asthma. So things to think about, could there be some extrinsic interthoracic airway compression? So those things like a, a vascular ring, a sling, an anonymous artery that's um, that's aberrant, that's compressing the trachea, uh, any kind of external mass that could be compressing the airway. Then you also think about intraluminal obstruction. Always foreign body would be higher on my list for certainly one of the most common causes of intraluminal obstruction. Or if they have some other, like increased mucus that just is persistent in the airway. So before, you know, we still think about cystic fibrosis, although it's much less likely. Then airway malacia, tracheomalacia, laryngomalacia, tracheobronchomalacia, those are all things that could be partial reason or could be an alternative cause for persistent wheezing. And then always thinking about a swallowing dysfunction, especially the smaller, younger children, that that could be a contributing cause for their symptoms and perhaps some wheezing just from the irritation of, say, uh, aspiration or potentially re reflux. And then again, as again, back to the risk factors that we talked about, think about any modifiable risk factors. So if you could hit the advance there. So secondary smoke reduction, um, reduced exposure to air pollution, that's a hard thing to control, but you know, certainly high HEPA filters, certainly if we have more wildfires again this summer, that's something that you, there's some data suggests that Cleaning the air with with uh, air filters can reduce exposure to the um, outside air pollution. Assess the immunization status. So uh, Eva's going to talk a little bit again about you know making sure they're fully immunized. Always encouraging flu uh, immunization. Evaluation for allergies. Again, the, the this can sometimes be a little tricky in this age group. With what we're taught is that. Um, doing an allergy evaluation for a child less than three years of old may not always be accurate. In other words, you could have some false negatives at a younger child, but if it's positive, it's probably a true positive. Okay. Uh, we have another um, point in the chat. Um, can the team speak to that, please? Well, I'm sorry, I didn't see the, I didn't see the, let me find it real quick. I don't know how to say it or I would read it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, subglottic stenosis. Um, sure. Yeah, every now and then we'll we'll definitely see subglottic stenosis. Usually that when I've seen that, it's been more a little bit more strider, but it can be inspiratory and expiratory wheezing sometimes too. So yeah, definitely any kind of, you know, that would, I would classify that as yeah, probably more of an intraluminal obstruction, a fixed obstruction. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then of course always think about compliance and adherence. Um uh, we're never as uh we always can always uh, have to have that in the back of our mind. And always hard to sometimes assess is how well are the patients either doing the medications or are they maybe using the best technique. And then, with all that in mind, you can think about stepping up treatment. So next slide. So you know certainly an alternative treatment is to be stepping up to an ICS LABA. Um, you know, we Advair, for instance, is still available as an, um, and it could be potentially something to think about. But our, you know, at least our practice here in, in Cincinnati, we're a little more hesitant to step up unless they're having some of these higher risk factors for developing asthma, um, such as, you know, aller positive allergy testing, a strong family history, history of eczema. You know, certainly if there's a strong history of atopy or evidence of atopy, we're more likely to think about stepping up either the dose of the inhaled steroids or going to an ICS LABA. 
But if that's not the case, you know, another alternative, if you don't mind, advance, is to think about a short course of azithromycin. Next slide. Um, so there's two ways, there's two, there's two manuscripts that have proven that this is pretty effective. Both were published right about the same time. Um, the first one came out of uh, here in the United States, which looked at 12 per kilo for five days for azithromycin. And then another paper that came out not short, right after that came out of Europe. I think it was Sweden where they used 10 per kilo for three days. And both were, again, very effective in being able to prevent um, or reduce the incidence of severe reactive airways disease in these preschool wheezers. And the reason why these work is not 100% known, it's probably more in an anti-inflammatory pathway that's not on the steroid side of things. And remember, a lot of these preschool weavers, weezers, they're, they're really probably different animals compared to your, your more classic allergic asthma patients. So this is not uncommonly, they'll be in a yellow zone. And then lastly, I'm just going to finish up, and this is something that will, uh, I'm sure we, we certainly get questions about not uncommonly. So the family's anxious, does this mean their child's going to have asthma for the rest of their life? And of course, that's always going to be a hard question to answer, but there are some tools. So if we advance, um, there is uh, something we that was developed here since Cincinnati called the Pediatric Asthma Risk Score, the PARS. And you can advance. Um, that's developed using data from a, a, a large uh, childhood allergy and air pollution study that was done here in Cincinnati years ago, where they were basically showing the closer proximity a patient was to a major highway or, uh, or spe specifically diesel particulate exposure, the more likely they're going to have asthma. But they were able to follow these patients long term, and they were able to come up with some predictors that were that could help answer this question about more likely to have asthma, at least by the age of seven. And um, it's outperformed, there's been many models and at least uh, there's pretty good data suggest this might be one of the better ones for predicting asthma development in children. So go ahead, advance, Brooke. And so this is what it looks like. It's relatively simple. There's six questions, you either answer, the, the family answers or you answer yes or no. And then you add up the score and based, up on, based on that score, it gives you what's the likelihood of having asthma when the child is uh, in school age. Um, you know, there's uh, one thing about this, of course, that we're a little bit uncomfortable about. It's question five about the African-American race, and we're obviously trying to get away from any type of racism in medicine. So I know they're actively, they believe that this is really a marker of socioeconomic and demographic factors. So I think the next version of this is actually going to include a zip code instead. And this, uh, advance one more slide, one more for me. And this is, if you're interested, this is something that you can download uh, on both with Google or on your iPhone. It's called, again, just a look for PARS. And we, we use it more when we're trying to think about that decision about the dilemma. If you're, you're at this child who, with preschool wheezing, it just keeps exacerbating, even if they're on asthma, on daily steroids. You know, if we're starting to think about step up, you know, if they, again, if they high score for the PARS, we're more likely to step up on the ICS, ICS LABO side of things. Whereas if they don't have a high PAR score, we're more thinking, gonna think more about going around the azithromycin side of things. Okay, that's all I got, Brooke. Thanks, Dr. Hardy. That advanced too quickly. Um, this was uh, one of the uh, question and answers or the questions that came in. Um, are we able to kind of break this down a little bit more uh, between viral rees, viral wheeze, and anything else that they would see in very young patients? Well, I guess the only thing, the only like my answer to that is, you know, we do now for not a small percentage of our patients in this preschool wheezing, we include azithromycin in the yellow zone. So usually our yellow zone will be albuterol first. And then we have, depending on the patient, um, some of them will even go straight to an azithromycin course. And Dr. Hardy, do you have like so many doses per year that you would say you would do, or do you sort of just say it could even be six times a year or what would you? I mean, it kind of depends if, you know, I always get uncomfortable if they're doing it all the time, because, you know, they're, you, what you're always working, one thing you want to try to, reduces any type of 
uh, resistance to antibiotics, you know, for instance, and you don't want the family to overuse this too much, but you know, there isn't a, there isn't a number per se, but if a child is doing it a lot, you know, I want to make sure that I'm going back to the slide I showed you earlier, that I'm not missing some other reason for the wheezing other than reactive airways disease. Thank you. Any additional questions for Dr. Hardy? No, I just want to make a comment about this. So even if it's viral wheezing, it's not necessarily asthma like you're you're just treating. It's still a good idea to give them a asthma home management plan. I often say like even though it says asthma, we're using med medications that treat asthma and your child has lots of inflammation. So they kind of understand like green zone, I don't need anything for every day, but when I'm getting sick, these are the signs and symptoms to watch for. This is my dose. Just kind of gives them something to have that they can reference at home when they're outside the office. Um, so I, I, in my practice, give these out even with like viral wheezing, um, uh, because it just helps give them something to have to put on their fridge or in their, you know, something to file away for when they get sick, they can reference. Yeah, we have one that we, that I work with Angela, but we um, have like the viral wheeze plan. We just changed the title of it and we have it pre-filled for the high dose uh, steroids that we do just because it makes it easy just to fill those out in the winter time when we're doing a lot of this um, viral wheeze management for these preschoolers. A good pro tip. Any other questions from the group? Um, as always, if you think of something, I'm an email away. But Dr. Johnson, we can go to you. Okay, thanks. And I am a general pediatrician, like I said, maybe in the first call, but maybe didn't meet everybody officially um, after that. So um, Dr. Hardy and Dr. Marco are the professionals here and I um, am a pediatrician. So I'm just like the rest of you um, learning as I go along. And um, this is a school age as asthmatic that we're going to be talking about today. Um, so this is an eight-year-old boy who's here for a well visit. And this is a patient I just pulled from my practice a few weeks ago. Um, he was diagnosed with asthma at age five. He's had no hospitalizations. He had one ER visit um, for asthma over the past three years. It was not in the past year. Um, currently is on fluticasone, 110, two puffs BID uh, for some moderate persistent asthma. He said he takes it most days. Mom is pretty much gives him independence to take his medicine um, and doesn't do a lot of supervision with it. Um, he it takes albuterol. He says he actually takes it a few days per week uh, for a cough and wheezing. Um, he doesn't have, he, he says the cough and wheezing sometimes when he's running around, sometimes when he's just watching TV. So he doesn't have a specific trigger that he can point out for that cough and wheeze. He says he uses the spacer. He has a spacer with a mouse piece. Um, triggers, mom will say URIs um, and activity seems to be plus minus. And then again, sometimes they just don't know what triggers he has. Um, for past medical history, he does have a history of allergic rhinitis and conjunctivitis. He does take Flonase daily and then cetirizine and catadophen eye drops, just PRN, uh, like in spring and fall. History of eczema um, in, when he was younger, but no, no symptoms for the past few years. And then at home, there are no smokers and no pets. So uh, when we're looking at this kid, we sort of say, like like Dr. Hardy said, like, how do we uh, qualify him? So he, um, I don't know if you can see my, I guess you probably can't see my cursor on here. So he is in the um, 5 to 11, obviously, age group. Um, and I know it's small in here, but symptoms, he's having symptoms um, more than two days per week. Um, because he's using the albuterol inhaler a few times, more than a few times per week. Um, he, well, if you ask him about nighttime awakenings, he says no nighttime awakenings. Um, it's, you know, he's an eight-year-old. He doesn't, it's hard to quantify whether it interferes with activity, but he is taking that albuterol inhaler a few times per week. Um, and again, he's, like, that would be Saba more than two days per week. Um, we don't, he doesn't see pulmonology, so I don't have any um, lung function tests on him. Um, so I would qualify him in the not well controlled um, category, and he's already on Flovent uh, one or not so Flovent fluticasone. I'm sorry, one ten, um, and so not well controlled. Even though he's on a controller, um, we know like looking at Williams or Dr. Hardy's um, assessment, he's not 100% compliant on his medications, but fairly compliant on medications. So, in thinking about this child, um, 
many of my my kids that I see now that are um, a moderate persistent asthmatics that are not well controlled on a controller or are just moving from like a mild intermittent to a moderate inter, uh, persistent. I am putting on smart therapy. So you can go to the next slide, Brooke. Um, so if we look at um, this child, um, we'd put him on the, um, he was already on a daily low dose ICS, so step two and a PRN Saba and really failing that therapy. I, again, there could be some quite question of full compliance. Um, so putting up to step three, which would be a daily and PRN combination low dose ICS for Motorol, um, which would be the smart therapy. So for this child, again, um, you could say like, we're gonna really work on compliance with um, step two and making sure you're taking this every single day, but he actually seemed to have fairly good compliance. So um, I chose to move him to step three um, for the daily and PRN um, smart therapy. Um, and put them on, um, I'm finding that um, Medicaid in Ohio seems to be covering Dulera more than Simbacort. So before I was using Simbacort, but now have moved to Dulera. So, um, you know, advise the family that you would, since he's eight, um, you would do the um, two puffs in the morning, two puffs at night, and then he would have four more puffs over the day to use. And so filling out an asthma action plan for the family to go over how you would, um, transition to smart therapy. I still do prescribe um, the albuterol, the Saba. Um, then I say, put this in the back of your medicine cabinet or put it in the kitchen cupboard way in the back um, and only bring this out for the red zone. So I still do prescribe it for the family, um, but I say, do not use this regularly. Um, and then I also make a plan for school because the family often, I think one of the most common questions I get with smart therapy is, well, what do we do at school? Do you want me to use um, the, you know, albuterol at school, or do you want me to be using the um, the combined inhaler? So I make sure they have a combined inhaler to use at school and at home. Um, and then really, like I said, the, the albuterol is just, um, I use, just use as uh, in the red zone. I say, if you're using this, please call our office or go to the ER um, that you're not using this regularly. Cause I think that getting that transition and getting families out of that habit is a, is a big, big issue. Um, this child, some people, like I presented this case with the residents last week and they said, well, what about, um, inc you know, starting him on Singulair because he has this um, allergic history. Um, so you can move to the next slide, uh, Brooke. Uh, oh, sorry, this is just a, a graph of, of um, low, medium and high dose therapy. Um, sorry, Susan says lots of barriers to commercial insurances. Do you use, sorry. Um, use albuterol school and these kids on smart. Like I said, I, I actually um, have not found it to be a barrier. I've, I just prescribe for two inhalers um, and I've not found it to be a barrier to using smart at school. Um, and I just um, have an asthma action plan that I give the family to, to take to school as well um, so that they know how to use it as well. Because I think sometimes school nurses may not be as familiar with using smart therapy, um, but I haven't found it to be a barrier. I don't know. Dr. So, Marco or Dr. Hardy. I um so the my only concern is sometimes when you um only get two canisters and you don't have that extra one if you go over you're during your month. So you can leave one at school and that should ideally last them all school year. So generally you can get two a month with um smart regimen um when you do it. So they should generally be okay. Um it's just that kind of when you take that first one to school, you may um they may not have that like extra one from home, but it usually evens out as the months go on. Um, sometimes for commercial insurance, if I can't get it, which I have, um, I do send albuterol to school, but that's, I, I try to do it not that way, but um, sometimes, yeah, there's just, there's no option with a private or commercial insurance. I actually, I wrote for three inhalers last week. I don't know if it's going to work or not, <laughs> but uh, probably not. They'll keep us but, updated. Uh, yeah, one for school and then two be in case, you know, this was a pretty bad asthmatic, you know, because I was worried they're going to over, you know, they're going to run out with the smart with even with two inhalers. Well, no, this was a situation where it was um, a mom and a dad are divorced. So, the, you know, so you need one for mom's house, one for one for dad's house, mm -hmm. and then one for the school. Yeah. 
And then, sorry, just to one more thing about the school thing, only because it's come up a few times actually this winter for me, um, the school nurses uh, sometimes are really confused. And I've gotten a couple that refused to use that medication because they didn't realize it was able to be used for rescue despite having the paperwork filled out. So I have had to have a couple um, conversations with the school nurse, but after you explain it to them, they have been really great. Um, uh, they just didn't realize. And so it was just an unknown for them. Uh, so if you do encounter that, I found, um, either just a, a quick conversation or a um, message seems to work really well. And next slide, Brooke. So like I said, um, the residents were asking, should we test this kid for allerg allergies? And then we already know he has seasonal allergies and then um, think about adding singular instead of ramping up to smart therapy. So um, next slide. So this is from um, the NHLBI guidelines on um, indoor allergy medication. So before we used, to, I mean, at least I used to do say like everybody with asthma, like do indoor allergy medication, you know, with carpeting and get rid of carpeting, you know, worry about stuffed animals in the bed and sort of do all that. Now the recommendation is really do this selectively for kids that actually have positive allergy symptoms or have positive skin testing or um, IgE testing. Um, so not doing it universally like we might have been, some of us might've been trained a long time ago. Um, so you can do skin prick testing. We don't have that available in our office. Um, so practically, if you're not referring to Palm for these kids or to allergy immunology, you could consider doing IgE testing. Um, there are IgE panels like respiratory panels um, like we have available at our institution. Um, I'd think Dr. Hardy, you'd have probably have a, a panel they use down in Cincinnati, but thinking about, um, you could ask your local, um, hospital, what panels are available or what lab that you're using, what panels are available for respiratory um, antigen testing and do IgE testing. Um, specifically, we know that like cockroaches, rodents, um, those are ones you can do some more um, particular mitigation in the home for. Um, we obviously know it's smoke exposure, not an allergy, but like is a risk factor, but for actual allergy um, ones, if you want to be selective, you could pick some specific ones that you know that you could help the families with mitigation. Um, so again, not doing universal allergy mitigation for kids that don't actually have positive allergy symptoms. And it could be by history you're doing it, but um, but if you're not really sure are these um, issues, then you could do specific testing for that. I don't know if um, Dr. Hardy or Dr. Marco have other additional thoughts on allergy mitigation. No, I, I totally agree with you. I, I often there's nothing you can do about it, but every now and then, you know, you, you do find stuff, especially if the patient has pets, for instance, uh, there's been several times where they have a cat and they're, you know, blazing hot on their rest for, for cat allergy. And so then you have to have the discussion about that, or at least, you know, talk about how can we reduce, you know, pet, pet exposure, or if it's dust mites, for instance, um, you know, then you can do some mitigation from that perspective. All right, and next slide, Brooke. Okay, and then we talked about vaccines. Don't forget your vaccines. So we know we're in the midst of a upsurge in influenza. Um, and I know there's a question about um, how do you help overcome resistance for families uh, for an influenza vaccine? So kids with asthma, um, I think I presented this data earlier this um, in the series, but um, asthma is the most common underlying disease um, for people that are hospitalized um, with um, influenza and children with asthma are four times more likely to be hospitalized um, with asthma than children with with influenza than children um, with influenza without asthma. So I think just saying, wow, we're really seeing an uptick of, of flu and we're seeing kids that are hospitalized. I know that I've had a few kids in the past week that have been hospitalized by own practice, but um, talking through their increased risk of hospitalization, we've had you know, some kids actually die from, um, you know, severe complications. So um, just not that we want to scare families, but just talking through the real risks and four fourfold increase is a pretty significant increased risk. So um, sometimes those, we know that, you know, facts don't always convince families with immunizations, um, but um, some families will be convinced with with facts. Um, so that's, that's something that I will talk with families about. Um, and we know there might be some additive effect if they start getting the flu one year, even though it doesn't necessarily cover the variants the next year, there is maybe some slight decreased risk if we if we start doing flu vaccines, even later in the season when the flu season is sort of winding down. I say this may 
help protect you um, even in the coming year, not as well as getting a flu shot that year, but may have some additive effect as well. Um, so that's something to, to think through with, with families that are hesitant um, this year. I know, I think with since the start of the COVID vaccine, I've seen more vaccine hesitants, but um, something to, to think about. And then pneumococcal vaccine, this is something that I, I'm still... Um, trying to get um, into my practice um, is giving the pneumococcal vaccine to children with moderate to severe persistent asthma. Anybody up to age 18 with moderate to severe persistent asthma um, should be having a pneumococcal 20 or pneumococcal or the PCV or PPV SV 23. So the pneumococcal 23, um, at least they should get one dose of that, even if they completed their initial pneumococcal series. So if they've never had PCV 20 or pneumococcal 23, and they've otherwise completed their um, pneumococcal series, they should still get additional dose of this because um, we know that they are increased risk for um, pneumonia and hospitalization. So this is a new recommendation, again, that came out last summer by the CDC. Um, we have are trying to integrate this into EPIC in our practice. So we actually have a little um, health maintenance gap reminder in our storyboard. If you're not an EPIC, um, thinking of ways that you might remind yourself to give these um, children an increased risk of this vaccine. I think it's going to take us a while for us to sort of get this in, into our normal practice, but um, but something that is recommended by the CDC. And then there's this this special um, app, and it's also a web-based version, the Pneumorex Vax Advisor, because I think the pneumococcal vaccine is one of the most complicated rural vaccines there is. Um, and, you know, many times I'll have to sort of say like, okay, this kid had this many vaccines and they're this old. And you can go to that um, Pneumorex uh, Vax Advisor and they will um, lead you in the right direction of whether the child needs the vaccine or not. But um, but I know it's complicated. Um, so please, please, but please, please, please keep it on your mind and also talk to your staff about it. Because I think sometimes our staff will, will be the ones that also remind us oh, Dr. Johnson, do you want to make sure you get this kid this vaccine? So I think the more people that we are aware of it, the more we can help each other um, remember to give these vaccines to kids with moderate to severe persistent asthma. And I think that's it. I just installed the app, at Eva. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> did, um, did you guys, did anyone want to make any comment about Singular and the potential side effects of Singular or Monolucast rather? So none of the residents talk about it, but I know, um, I think anybody, I, there was a big article in the New York Times, it was probably about a month ago about the um, psychogenic, uh, not psychogenic, there's uh, psychiatric side effects of, of Singular that I think um, some families are asking more about. Um, so um, just keep that in mind if you're, Think about Singular, um, that there are, you know, more reports of the um, psychiatric side effects that I think some people are making some people hesitant to um, add that and are moving toward a different direction. But yeah, I will just let... Angela, what about you guys? Are you we're, we're kind of we're trying to shunt people away from that. You know, I um I counsel everyone, you know, I say it can cause changes in mood or affect, or if you feel like after your kids had it, they are different in, in either of those, or if they're really young, getting extra fussy, like out of the normal, like, um, fussy, you know, toddler or tantrum time period. And, um, you know, I say kind of counsel, like if this happens, stop it, please call us, we won't use it. And I also make a point not to use it in kids who have prior um, mental health issues or behavioral issues, because um, the risk to me outweighs the benefit um, in those particular patients um, for the most part. Um, Dr. Johnson, thank you so much. Just real quick on uh, vaccines. Uh, we are hearing that kids are still um, behind on kind of all their schedules. Um, is there a good um, uh, umbrella term or um, kind of opt-out method to talk to families about kind of getting all of them that they're behind on? I mean, there's not you. There's not any rule. There's not too many vaccines to give in a visit. I mean, we've some given eight vaccines in a visit. So I just say, let's get you caught up. I think Sometimes the motivation of kids needing to get enrolled in school is a good thing. No, it depends on what you know the state does with vaccine opt-outs, but um, but that often for daycare, um, many younger kids, the daycares often still require it, even if schools don't require it. So um, that is a motivation for many many families. Um, but I always just say, I have three kids of my own. I feel very strongly I would never give something to your kids. I want to give to my own kids. I think that sometimes. If you have a good relationship with the family, that 
will help, um, you know, overcome the barrier. They're not doing any special testing on their kids, but it is complicated. And there's many, many, unfortunately, more opt-outs than we used to see. You know, I we're keeping data on how well, the percent of our patients with asthma that are getting flu vaccines. I don't remember the exact number, but I think, I think it's really close to what we saw earlier today. I think it's around 50, 60 percent. So I think it's pretty pretty prevalent throughout, probably not just Ohio, but the country that there's a lot of vaccine hesitancy. But I, I, Eva, I think you make some really good arguments. And I agree. I rarely see healthy kids die of pneumonias, but I still do. And it's almost always secondary to flu. And, you know, I think that data point that you talked about four times more likely to be admitted if you have asthma and you have flu is a pretty strong argument. That's I, I definitely pull that out. And I like the personal approach. Your kids, their kids, I like that. Thank you. Dr. Marco, teenage patient? Yeah, I'm, I'll be quick. Mine's not too, too bad. So I tried to make this case very um, real world in the sense that it doesn't have exact numbers. This child is a teenager, so they aren't going to be able to tell you exactly what's going on. So that's the whole premise for this one, because this is what I've seen like all the time. So it's a 16 year old female, they're coming in for a fault appointment for cough and wheezing. And this is meant to be from like a pediatrician's um, office or a pulmonary office. Um, they have longstanding asthma. It was worse when they were about six to 10 years old. Then they felt like they had a period of like less symptoms and improvement over 11 to 15 years old. And in the last year, it just seems like it's starting up again to be more bothersome. So the last visit was six months ago and you prescribed a low dose ICS for kind of mild persistent asthma symptoms at that time. Um, and then next slide. Um, so they use the ICS for about maybe one to two months, but they forget a lot. Um, they might remember to use it two time, two to three times a week. And this is after you kind of like probed a lot. I mean, you had to get them off their phone. No one's paying attention in the office. Like this is a very standard appointment. Um, mom says she does not supervise their use. They, they go to high school. She's busy. She goes to work in the morning. So this kid's like on their own taking it morning and night. Um, so when you go over the inhalers, she's really confused about which one is which. And she um, says she doesn't know like why she picks which one she has. Sometimes she uses a blue one, sometimes she has an orange one, and she also has a red one that she got one time, but she doesn't like always have the red one, so she's not sure why. Um, and then she uh, she ran out of that red one, like I said, and the orange one didn't help when she used it last week. Um, and so I, I always bring out a chart, and I have a chart with all the pictures of the inhalers, and I have her point out. And so she's able to identify maybe the orange is fluticasone, the blue and the red are both um, various brands of albuterol. Um, and then you get this sense, as you might already be getting, that she has a lot of confusion, which medications are which, how to use them. And then you look back at the last appointment, which, you know, uh, you were just trying to refresh what, what went on and you thought, like, it seemed like they were confused at that appointment as well. Um, so next slide. So just to get a little more information, she thinks maybe she's used it, coughing or wheezing two to three times, but like, I don't know, she's like, I can't really remember what happened last week. Um, nighttime symptoms, she doesn't usually wake up, but mom thinks maybe she coughs pretty often, but mom said her room's not on the same level as her, so she's not really paying attention a whole lot, um, but she thinks maybe a couple times a week. The quick relief inhaler use, she thinks maybe three to four times, but sometimes it'll be less. If she's sick, she'll use it more. And then um, exercise, she doesn't have gym class and she doesn't do any organized sports, but doesn't complain of daily life activities, of like going up and downstairs, things like that. Um, she has in the last 12 months used um, oral corticosteroids two times, but none in the last six months. Um, no ED, no hospitalizations. Um, uh, no new changes to the home environment, new pets, stable seasonal allergies on her antihistamine. Like she doesn't complain like that there's something, a new trigger for her that she is aware of. Um, next slide. So I wanted to highlight this as like very confusing because oftentimes people don't fit into the boxes of these um, mild, moderate, and severe. And you sometimes have to kind of say, are they in between a mild to moderate? So if you highlight, um, I highlighted here, she's 12 and up a area. So she can fit some of the maybe some some of her answers is like mild and then but then she says sometimes I don't know, like it's worse some weeks. Um, so she's more in the moderate. So it's kind of like it's unclear because the history is really poor, but you you think it's somewhere in between these this mild and moderate. 
And so that if you look down on um, the recommended recommended therapy for initiating um, is kind of between the step two and step three. And the reason I chose this one is because she's really not using any inhaled corticosteroid because she's so confused about her inhalers. So she's basically like inhaled steroid naive at this juncture. Um, so next slide. Oh, well, my my graphics. I didn't do them very well. So if we look at the left side, um, age, this is from the NHLBI. So age 12 years and up. So she's kind of in between that step two to step three. These are, these are our options. You can consider this daily low dose ICS and Saba, which she was already on and really struggled to use properly, maybe need some more guidance, or she's kind of in that step three where it's this daily and as needed combination, ICS for motor, all that smart regimen. And then if you can click one more, I think my other. So then I just wanted to put in the Gina one as well. So that's the international asthma guideline. So again, I just want to highlight she's kind of in between this step two and step three. In the Gina guideline, as you can see, the big difference in step one and two, they recommend as needed ICS um, Fomoterol instead of the daily low dose ICS Saba combo as kind of their preferred. But then in step three, it's the same as the NHLBI step three. So it's just like a slight difference. Um, and then if you go forward um, slide, um, for her, now you could do this a variety of ways, like you could try and re-educate and explain, but I'm guessing that maybe all of you have felt like she's just really confused and maybe there's too many inhalers. She might benefit from that single canister of where you used the every day and um, as needed. Um, and since she kind of is in between that two and step, like kind of step two and step three, she it's probably a good idea to start her on daily and as needed um, ICS Fomoterol because quite frankly, I think at the end of the day, she's probably going to start using it just as needed um, depending on her symptoms um, just because she's a teenager and this is often what we see. Um, and so I, this is what I, I would recommend doing, and this is probably what I would do in my, my, my own office, um, and really educate them that this is your one inhaler, you are going to be using this, um, this is your only canister, you're going to use daily and as needed, and then actually ask them to take all those other medications and, you know, explain you have one albuterol, and that's the one you only use if you're in the red zone, and put them, put these away, like this is your one canister. Um, I find that this can help decrease um, confusion and simplify their regimen, especially in this type of patient. Um, and I think that's it for this one. I didn't want to get too into the weeds. I didn't go into like triggers, but you should do all the things that they discussed in the other cases. Thanks, Dr. Marco. Um, a question that came in previously, and, and you gave some good information. Uh, some providers are switching uh, from using ACTs uh, and the ARQs that they used before to Gina. Do you want to speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so we kind of touched a little bit this on on this in Dr. Hardy's. Um, so the someone asked, I think, in the question, are they validate? Is the Gina one validated? And the answer is, I don't think it's validated based off of the information I looked up for this. While it's a test that can help give you some information about symptom control, really like the asthma control test and the asthma quality control questionnaire. Um, or control questionnaire um, are really the main validated ones for this age range. And these are, I, I tried to look just to make sure to make sure I wasn't speaking out of turn. And so this is just some information I pulled from the GINA guidelines um, saying what they recommend. And some points on six and older. Yeah, so basically the same thing. It's just the GINA control test is a simple consensus-based test, but it's not necessarily like validated and you there are these numerical tests which are a little bit easier to use because they have a like a set number if you're over or under this number you're controlled or not controlled whereas this one is um more of a just a, a, a it has no it has no numerical value to it to say like if you're above or below this it's kind of you're able to gather this information and guide your decision making so i think you should pick something that works for you in your practice, um, but knowing that it's not necessarily like has a numerical cutoff. And uh, you had good points here around clarification of appropriate labeling of asthma severity. Yes, so there was a question about um, if you change their uh, control uh, classification throughout their 
or the year, for for instance. And so for uh, one of the examples, one if a patient is not controlled at their winter visit, um, that would require a step up in therapy. And so the question is, is do you leave them at mild persistent, even though now you've put them into a therapy that's step three, uh, closer to a moderate persistent asthma. And I think um, it's okay to do that. I, asthma is a chronic disease. It waxes and wanes in seasonality for a variety of reasons. Um, and so I don't think you should be too stringent about like, it's okay to change that to moderate persistent if you're following the stepwise guideline treatment. So it's it, it kind of all makes sense. So if someone else were to follow up that patient, they see that they're moderate persistent on their problem list and they have a moderate persistent like stepwise uh, medication. So I think it's okay to, it's a fluid diagnosis sometimes. Thank you. Any questions? I am being I'm mindful of time. Okay. Uh, hearing none, and in the interest of time, um, I will send out the next steps and information that is on the next slide in the Thursday email. It'll be on Thursday today. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you for uh, the medical expert team for sharing uh, their information. And I will be in touch with more information later. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a good week.